Hello. Hello. Good. Good to see you. Been a little while. Been a little while. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. I must give you a hug for all of the golf cart love. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming. Hello. Hi. Oh, Arno. Great to meet you. It's good to meet you. Yeah. You, you are a, a legend and, uh, and an important person in our culture, so I'm very happy to meet you. And I, I hope I will have time to visit your space. Do you think we'll have time tonight? For myself, yeah, for sure. Okay. Do you want to stay for the D Detroit film? Hello. Good. Uh, there's, there's a film after. There's, there's a film after. Sure. It's about, uh, I think it might be about the, the Detroit techno scene. Um, yes. I'm, I could watch it, but I, it's more important for me to see your space, so... Okay, good. I want to be kidnapped, okay? <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, uh, I was very happy. You know, they wanted me to come and speak last year, but I, I could not come. Uh, a dear friend of mine was dying at the time, and I'm like, I'm not leaving the city because I want to be there when he goes. Uh, and then Matthew said, will you come this year? And I said, yes. And then it was the same weekend as uh, Sideburn. So I'm happy about this. Yeah. Lots of things like uh, you Good, good. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Even if it's going to be in the rain and the mud. <laughs> Okay, I can live with one day of rain. I have the boots for it. Okay? I brought the boots for it. I think they're good with the mosquitoes. Uh-oh. I brought some things. Yeah, well, we'll try. You're really brave to do this. Really? Yeah, I mean... I do it all the time. Yeah, right? But, but there is a part of me that would have rather just stayed here for the 36-hour party in Mon Montreal. You can't <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> no, I want to be with my people. <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're so terrible. You got me. You really got me. <laughs> well done. Mathis. Mathis is in charge of the communication of last burn and he made some about like all we now talk about. Not only snarky, but like. It's good. So you're bringing some snark, a little bit of sarcasm, uh, but just enough. You know, have you ever read Africa Burns' uh, newsletter? I think they do a good job of, yeah. of writing this line uh, but between using snark to also reinforce the values. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a careful line because you don't want to be mean, but you want to be uh, edgy and remind people this is not a safe for consumption, yes. Yeah, if if you don't know how to find their newsletter, you just send me, figure out how to send me an email and I can uh, forward something to you. If, if you're in the communications role, I'll tell you the two of, uh, regional events that I think do a, a really great job with their newsletters are uh, Africa Burn and Playa del Fuego. Playa del Fuego is a little bit kinder, but incredibly on point with the values. The two of them, like if you weren't, if you read those, uh, you might find people that are communicating the same way. I love what they do. Yes, okay, but okay. Bonsoir tout le monde. Je vous inviterai à venir prendre place. On va commencer dans deux minutes. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm going to invite you to take a seat. We're going to start in two minutes. Thank you.
great pleasure. It's been a, a really great value. Ok, ok, on va laisser un peu de mots de French et de ce que je suis vraiment, vraiment, euh, merci d'être là ce soir, mais c'est encore là, c'est pour ce matin. C'est euh, une longue journée, c'est pas terminé. On a encore euh, un keynote, c'est un spiel, 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 c'est since 9 a.m. I know it's a, it's a long day. We have a lot of content. Thank you for holding on. And it's not over after the, this talk, this presentation keynote by uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Raspa. We're, we're going to have film showing, uh, film screening at 8. Also a great, great documentary. God said, give him drum machines. It's a premiere in Montreal. You, I strongly suggest you hang out with you and uh, with us and stay for the for that screening too. But I'm really extremely honored. Um, Uh, to have such a wise man to talk to us tonight, uh, Mr. Raspa, Stephen Raspa from Burning Man. Um, I discovered Stephen two years ago at a conference in Berlin called Envisioning Free Space, which is kind of like the alternative of the alternative anarchist uh, version of what we, the Night Summit we're running here tonight. And it was a panel with... Um, Uh, some, Dimitri Hegemann from Trezor, Trezor Club in Berlin. Um, one of the guys, I, don't, I, I forgot his name, who was uh, one of the founders of the Free Party movement in the UK, and uh, Mr. Raspa. And um, uh, I think you talked for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, and then the Q&A went on for at least another 45 minutes. Um, you know, you had all these anarchist squatters from Berlin, and. And you, 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 you held your point, and you, the questions were tough, and you, you had really great answers. So I, I, you know, that's when I, I figured he's the type of person we need in Montreal to discuss, um, discuss nightlife, discuss alternative spaces, alternative culture in general. So without further ado, please welcome Stephen Raspa. Mm. <laughs> Merci, Mathieu. Bienvenue, welcome. I'm very Uh, grateful to be here with you. Uh, as Matthew said, I am part of the Burning Man project, and I'll tell you, we think about it as a project and a social experiment. And so, uh, in that spirit, I want to share with you some uh, lessons and stories from our temporary city, which has brought us back into dialogue with permanent cities, as we think about what is really important about living in society and in cities together. Um, I should tell you that I, I began spelling my name with dollar signs as an artist in the mid-90s, before many rappers, I want to say. Uh, and I chose that because I wanted to raise questions about what was really valuable uh, as a, an artist. And so I 
foolishly appropriated what I perceive to be one of the more powerful symbols in the Western world, the American dollar sign, to use for frivolous creative uh, purposes. So thank you, Matthew, for thinking that I'm wise, but I'm also a bit of a wise ass. Uh, and in that spirit, uh, cities in the dust, what can permanent cities possibly learn from Burning Man? Uh, the other one. So the media often portrays us as a festival, but we don't really like that word so much because in the contemporary sense of that word, it has been corporatized. Uh, it often involves sponsors and advertisements and uh, coming to spend a lot of money and consume a culture instead of co-create it and experience it in a way that is participatory. Uh, we also don't book any uh, main stage acts or attractions. This is uh, a very different kind of operating model, which I'll tell you more about. Are we some kind of crazy survivalist camping trip? Well, uh, to some extent this is true, uh, uh, but it's not the whole story. Uh, the difficulty of camping in the desert uh, brings us together much more quickly as a community. And some of us joke that Burning Man is just uh, uh, kind of a recreational disaster area. Uh, we found out later that many of the same skills that we developed just to survive in the, the desert would be applicable to disaster relief in cities when we came home. To some, Burning Man is a spiritual pilgrimage. And this is something I'm very proud of. I think it is for me and, and for many. Uh, but rather than have specific dogma that would divide people, we offer ritual that unites people without dogma that would otherwise divide us. Um, and uh, the burning of a wooden humanoid sculpture, many people have said, well, what does it mean? And to that I say, whatever you want it to mean and whatever you find the deepest meaning in. Uh, its purpose is a civic ritual that helps uh, create shared experience that brings people together. And I think there's something very ancient about this, honestly, which sometimes we've lost in modern society. The temple image behind me uh, changes every year. We did not decide there should be a temple at Burning Man. It came as an art project like anything else, and then the, our community recognized the profound importance uh, of a place to remember loved ones who have passed. Uh, to leave things behind, to invoke things. And I'm very proud to say that we have people that come from every world religion and find something affirming, inclu including atheists that believe in nothing more than the power of art. Are we just the big old sculpture park? Um, we are very much about art, but not a sculpture park in the usual sense. It's not uh, art by just established artists meant to be consumed. Um, I think of it more as a kind of Olympics of human expression. And many people are first time artists, people that didn't even know that they could be artists. And many of these pieces are co-created in collaborative ways that build community. They are not just objects. Each one of these sculptures is connected often with hundreds of people and stories and relationships and social and expressive opportunities. We are a kind of innovation lab. Lots of people bring new technologies out to the playa for frivolous and creative and playful purposes, break them, and then sometimes find commercial applications and, uh, and public benefit applications for them. Um, there have been better tents designed. Um, Shift Pod, for example, uh, which has also a very, uh, I think, ethical approach to providing tents for disaster relief as well. Um, there have been people that have created social apps uh, to try to communicate with their friends that find application. Um, ecozoic toilets. And uh, Burning Man is trying to, at this point, also be a cauldron for uh, innovation around green technologies and sustainability. For the context of this talk, and for those of you that don't know about Burning Man, what is really relevant uh, for this forum is that it is indeed an actual city with 80,000 citizens that come from all over the world. And it uh, operates for eight days and nights, 24 hours a day. So there's a, an example of your 24 hour a day uh, nightclub uh, experiment. 
Um, we're the third largest Nevada metropolitan area when we are in existence. People must bring everything that they need to survive in the desert. Uh, the only thing sold is ice to avoid food spoilage, and because it does make frosty beverages in the desert, and that is quite nice. <laughs> we as organizers provide only the basic infrastructure, including 1,800 port loos There are no trash bins, because we are the largest Leave No Trace event in the world, and I can tell you we have probably trained and, and helped to propagate, propagate the idea of Leave No Trace uh, to, uh, to over a million people with our reach. And I like to joke, you can tell the burners sometimes in cities because they are bending down to pick up the trash that other people have dropped because we can't stop doing it. Um, and I think of us really as an experiment in civic innovation. We have people that come from all over the world to be part of this city. And I want to start with a question. Why are creative, talented, and innovative citizens from around the world attracted to Black Rock City, to our little temporary city in the desert. What's more, why do they come on what should be their vacation and work harder than they do at their normal jobs? Leave places where, where they have grown up, where their ancestors are buried in the ground, and come to our little temporary city in the desert and call it home, and perform stunning acts of generosity uh, and express themselves in ways they never even thought possible. Well, what are they getting from this uh, uh, temporary city that they're not getting in their year-round cities? And I want to say that this question um, haunts me. I'm not uh, raising it with any sense of ego. I'm raising it because there's something there, something that is missing in contemporary society and cities that our little social experiment is maybe offering a little more of. And let's see what the, maybe people are trying to get away from. Challenges that developed and rapidly developing cities face include rising rents and the displacement of art and cultural diversity and also economic diversity in cities. Increasing population density is, has been leading to sound complaints. All day long we heard stories about sound complaints. Sound, 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 right? I am concerned that as we build in more places for residents so close to places of entertainment without some forethought and strategy, that we risk our cities becoming quieter and quieter and losing some of their social function to even express joy. There's reduced social space and green space, as without meaning it, many of our cities have uh, been little by little transformed into real estate development products. Sit with that a minute. The decisions we make are so often based on economic return. Cities are looking to increase their tax base. I don't blame them, but there have to be other kinds of, of measures. Cities uh, that have gone too far are trying to figure out how to add this space back. And it gets a little harder, but I'll share some examples of how that can be done. And many cities risk losing their uniqueness, soul, and vitality. What makes them unique? What makes them soulful? And I'll say that as uh, this happens, you can uh, experience a long-term loss of innovation and young workers who want to live in fun and interesting and innovative and socially dynamic cities. And if you keep pushing art and culture and a living culture further and further outside of city centers, then what happens to the middle logically? It becomes calcified. At best, it can become a museum to its former cultural glory, and at worst, an expensive tourist trap with no uh, sense of authenticity. It can also lead to a growing gap between the wealthy and the poor. I was brought into conversation about uh, two years ago with uh, a, a group uh, that is very concerned about the potential for growing unrest in cities based upon the disparity between the wealthy and the poor. And I will add to that also, uh, there's one more imaginary bullet there that I had put in the presentation last night that is, uh, it, 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 that is subliminal right now. <laughs> and it is uh, a, a loss of social bonds and loneliness. The Surgeon General of the United States just came out uh, in 2023 with a report 
uh, acknowledging an, an epidemic of loneliness and social isolation that began before COVID and has become more compounded. So this might be why people are coming to our mm, little temporary city to get away from some of these things. Now, would you like the good news or the bad news? Okay, the bad news is Burning Man does not have all the answers. <laughs> and we are not a utopia, and we don't try to be. We're a social experiment. The good news is that there are things that, uh, that can be tried, and there are some things that are definite lessons that I have seen work in places. And so with that spirit, let's go a little bit back in time. How did this crazy thing start? It started very, very simply, and I think in no, not a very extraordinary way. Um, in 1986, a couple of friends that normally went to a summer solstice beach burn on Baker Beach in uh, San Francisco decided that uh, because the people who were organizing it weren't doing it that year, that they would create a sculpture, a wooden sculpture, and bring it down and burn it. And it was very small. It was maybe a, a two and a half meters. And um, when they, uh, and it was really the first Burning Man was a family picnic between two families with their kids and a couple of friends sharing what they had. And when they lit the sculpture uh, on fire, people came from up and down the beach and it turned into a happening. Suddenly there was music, there were, you know, conversation, people hanging out around the fire, doing probably what people have been doing for, you know, thousands of years, gathering around fire. <laughs> um, in 1990, it grew to be 500 people. They decided to keep doing this every year. And in uh, 1990, the beach authorities came and said, you can't do that here. Um, and you know what? They weren't terribly bad about it. I actu we actually found some old footage of interactions with the, the, uh, the, the, the beach uh, authorities. And they were pretty reasonable. Um, but they kind of just didn't know what to do with us. We didn't fit in a box. And I'll tell you also, I don't think that the organizers then had the sense that they might have somehow engaged in a conversation with the city and might have somehow found a place for us to do this in the city. In a parallel uh, universe, I sometimes imagine what if Burning Man had stayed in San Francisco? What uh, uh, creative power could we have unleashed in that city? But instead, we went to the most remote location that anybody knew where we could get away from the uh, confines of polite society and experience freedom to do whatever we wanted to make up. And at first, it was an autonomous zone, but then over the next uh, 11 years or so, something very strange and ironic happened and quite magical. The ironic part is um, that we became uh, responsible for operating a city of our own. The interesting thing is that we recreated a version of society according to our own values as creative people. So maybe this is what happens when you take a creative scene and you throw it in the middle of nowhere and you let it run its course. So, Burning Man's culture is philosophically based in 10 guiding principles. And it's important that they were not written down until 2004, well into the experiment, after, in some ways, the culture had been formed. And we only wrote them down then with great uh, reluctance because the culture had begun to spread to other places. And people kept saying, what do we say about this crazy thing? And what's important? And how does it turn out well? That's about where I begin to add my value as a community organizer. Um, uh, I was part of the group that uh, helped sort of figure out, well, what are the important parts of the culture that should go out into the world and how do we talk about it? And to the credit of our primary cultural founder, Larry Harvey, he never wanted to write anything down that would limit the experience, knowing that if you describe a work of art and tell people what it means, then that's all it will ever mean. And you can lose the art magic. So we didn't want to write anything down. But we persuaded uh, through various conversation to land upon these uh, 10 guiding principles. And I want to say they're not rules, uh, they are guidelines. And some of them were written in opposition with one another to encourage critical thinking. It, the culture is rooted in philosophy and thought, but also in direct and shared experience. So among them are radical inclusion. Everyone is welcome. Uh, and I'll tell you, as an experiment, we've been thinking more deeply about what it means uh, to create inclusive spaces that are also welcoming. 
instead of uh, selling things, we encourage uh, acts of gifting and, and expecting nothing in return. And people perform stunning acts of generosity. Everything, all the art, uh, the various experiences, which I'll describe some of, are gifts offered to others without uh, a, a reciprocal transaction expected. And somehow in the desert, this has led to a culture of abundance. Decommodification is a word we kind of made up to say that we uh, stand as an alternative to uh, consumption models, to sponsorships and advertising, uh, and a transactional consumer society that we had become alienated by. And instead, we seek to place the emphasis back on authentic human relationships and people just being people together again. Radical self-reliance, you must bring everything that you need to survive in the desert. And, uh, you know, the, the good thing about that is you find out that you, you can rely on your inner faculties and resources and you can accomplish much more than perhaps you realized. And in some ways, this is also uh, linked to DIY culture uh, and uh, even to our connections with the entire maker movement. We are famous for radical self-expression. And some people think of radical only as extreme. I would like everybody here to know that when that word was written, we were thinking of the Latin uh, 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 root of, of radix, which really means uh, root or innate or fundamental. And the, the full meaning of radical self-expression is showing up authentically as who you really are. It has nothing to do with dressing up, but boy, it's fun to dress expressively and to play with other possible selves through adornment. And the art and everything is a form of radical self-expression. Communal effort. We value collaborative uh, experiences and working together. And this is a big part of how our community bonds are formed. Civic responsibility. All of our gatherings are legal, properly permitted, and ensured to provide a safe space for people to volunteer and for our community to gather. But I'll tell you something else. That approach is also valuable for social change. It brings us into relationship with government, relations, uh, relate, government um, departments and representatives, with permitting agencies, with the formal legal and political and socioeconomic world in which we live in. And um, by interacting with it in some ways, we hope to shift things a little bit in more human and expressive directions. Um, I'll also say that public service is a big part of our values. Leaving no trace, we leave no trace of our, act of our activities when uh, we are done uh, in the desert. We clean up everything. There can't be any sawdust, not a sequin, nothing. Um, and uh, the deeper meaning of this is to leave a positive trace energetically wherever you go. Uh, so some people don't think a Burning Man is particularly environmentally responsible. I can tell you uh, otherwise that there is a deep and strong reverence for nature and our relationship with it. In fact, I'll tell you that running through these principles are often uh, the relationship of self, the concept of self, of social self, one's relationship to others in society, and, the lar and our relation relationship to the larger context, uh, uh, which is the natural world of which we are all a part. We expect everyone in the city to participate in some way and make the city great. And uh, immediacy, there's the full description there. Uh, the way I like to think about immediacy is being very present to your relationship with yourself, how you stand in relationship to other people, and again, to you know, the larger world, and to being open to whatever comes next. Each of these texts, by the way, I mean, each of these words have full texts that were written with a kind of poetry to them and to inspire thought. I encourage you to go and visit our website, read them, I spent probably four or five hours with a group that was working on the 50-year plan of Amsterdam just, talk, Amsterdam, just talking about a potentially a more principled approach to urban planning and how these uh, things inform our decisions about urban planning. I think of these as a kind of soft architecture for our city. And they form, in some ways, an implicit social agreement. But they're also a reflection of our values as a, as a creative culture. Now let's talk a little bit about the physical urban plan and layout. You have here the layout of Black Rock City. 
And you'll see that there's extensive uh, social surface area. We have a grand esplanade at the center of the crescent, or since we're in a French-speaking country, perhaps we should call it the croissant. Um, and um, we, have, uh, we originally had one plaza. Over the years, we've added more plazas throughout the cities and plazalets and uh, organized people into neighborhoods and villages to try to encourage social interaction. At the very center of this uh, uh, semicircle, we place what is most important to us, uh, the large-scale art pieces. Uh, and, uh, and they are not there as objects. They are also, it's also a, a grand forum for shared experience and interacting with the art expressively. But you'll notice that the circle is not closed. What is it facing? It is facing the desert, the mountains beyond, the glorious sunrises. So I like to point out that this urban plan, which both developed organically and then was consciously um, chosen, and we can modify each year to in increase or decrease uh, aspects or experiments of our urban plan. But this reflects values for social and expressive interaction, for um, uh, creative expression, and for being in relationship to nature. Only one possible version of this. Members of our community have chosen other uh, forms, by the way, in their own experiments of temporary cities, which I'll talk about as well. This is a little bit more detail. This was our 2022 um, plan. You'll notice in the back of the, the city and, and throughout, there are some open spaces. We could place every square inch of that if we wanted to. We have more people that want to come and would want to be placed everywhere, but we intentionally leave a place for unexpected things to enter our city. And I think of this as a, and, and our placement team refuses to place everyone. They want to have some spontaneity in the city. Uh, and we must make space also for people who are not affiliated with groups, art groups, or theme camps in our, in our culture. This is part of our value of radical inclusion. Uh, we also zone for loud sound. Uh, we, we place the loudest sound uh, camps on sort of the, the uh, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock sides of the city. And we also have sound etiquette uh, for vehicles that ride around with sound. That was discussed as something that was important in cities, and we have found it important in our city as well. I'll tell you also that there was one time uh, in, when I went to 96, the, there was a rave camp that was about uh, two kilometers or three kilometers from where everyone camped. And it was not satisfying. We didn't want to separate it from where everybody was in the city. And there were also some safety issues with doing that, with people getting uh, heat exhaustion, walking too far, or driving between places. So we brought things back in, and we actually first tried to become a pedestrian city and get everybody out of the vehicles to meet one another. And then we became a bicycle city. And then we incorporated art cars and mutant vehicles, which I'll talk more about. So the net result here is a participant-driven city where the citizens work collaboratively and social bonds and community are created through hard work and creative endeavors. And the participants really create the content and experiences that they want to have through three key avenues, but not just limited to this. There are approximately 400 art installations in the center of the city, but thousands throughout the city. And Burning Man, by the way, gives $1.2 million in art grants from our ticket sales to uh, uh, about 70 art projects a year. But most of the projects are self-funded. There are theme camps. Uh, there are about 1,300 theme camps and 63 villages. And a theme camp is a kind of fusion, uh, the way I think of it is a fusion between a residence, a community center, and a third space. Bars, the most fabulous nightclubs, restaurants, uh, meditation centers, gyms, uh, massage places, healing centers, everything you can imagine. All gifted experiences. Um, mutant vehicles, um, you might have seen a couple. There are over 400 mutant vehicles, uh, modified transportation uh, things. So even our public transportation system is a medium of, uh, of social expression. Along with our street signs, along with our lampposts, which have a ritualistic aspect of being lit each night by volunteers in our community uh, and then uh, lit the next night. In fact, our entire city I think of as a social sculpture that has been designed and evolved to lead to increased probability of people meeting one another, 
feeling accepted and encouraged, uh, creating spectacular works of art together, creating joy. I mean, we played with the knobs of this city, the proportions of it. It's kind of an urban planner's uh, dream to be able to do what we do. Um, and we've gotten very good at it, and, and you know, the, the, I want to say that um, our community has actually gotten very good at creating the city uh, in a collaborative, effective, joyful, flexible, and even transformational way. And our social cohesion and sense of belonging is off the charts. People often say they come to Burning Man for the, the art, they stay for the community and sense of belonging. They come back again for that. Uh, you may be interested to know, we also operate with our community in airport, which is one of the busiest in Nevada uh, during its uh, busy time with uh, flights taking off every, and landing every two minutes. Uh, we have a full medical services uh, that uh, some of it is hired and uh, some of it is uh, also volunteer. We have about 3,500 uh, cases to treat, um, really almost all of them are non-life-threatening, a, a lot of dehydration, a lot of uh, cuts and abrasions because people are climbing over things and doing fun things and they, they injure themselves. Um, but I want to say that um, it's overall like we operate a full-fledged city. And you would think with uh, all of this going on in a highly decentralized manner that it would be utter chaos. <laughs> But honestly, safety is, uh, is first in class. Uh, I want to read this to you specifically because it's kind of astonishing. You know, Burning Man has a very low incidence of person-on-person -person crime, no crowd control problems, no history of civic unrest, and almost no incident of violent crime. There are almost no traffic collisions, very few drug-related hospitalizations. Uh, fatalities are extremely rare. Lost children are always reunited with their parents, often within minutes and our gates can be closed and the perimeter secured instantaneously, should we need to in case of, uh, which by the way we do when a child is missing, the gates immediately close until we find that child within minutes, just as one example. Um, so we take uh, creating a safe space very seriously. And um, we have staff uh, and volunteers, a, a full 10% of our population of 80,000 people volunteer in key roles, and if they didn't do that, the city would not operate. Uh, and we have, uh, let's see, in, uh, we have about uh, 1,200 trained uh, Black Rock City Rangers uh, who are trained medi uh, in mediation and conflict uh, mediation with members of our community. Uh, they're often the first people our community call. They have tremendous community uh, social capital uh, and trust. They're not cops. They, they're not there to bust anyone. They're there to help and in some cases resolve uh, even sound com uh, complaints between neighboring groups. But we really help try to help the community uh, resolve their own issues. And then if uh, there is a situation where we need to escalate it to uh, law enforcement, then we will. And in some cases, like if somebody is selling drugs at our event, we will turn them over to the police. That is a, a bridge, a, 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 uh, an affront to our culture of gifting, honestly. So. <laughs> And uh, I will say also, shame on anybody that tries to capitalize on a culture in which artists have been showing up and pouring their life force and energy into something as a gift to be freely given. Um, and our people who range from toddlers to 80-year-old people know it's their city because they've helped to create it. I love our people and I love how they show up. And some people say, well, you have the best people that show up. I don't believe that. I think we have helped create some, in some ways the conditions that allow people to be at least better or at their best. Our uh, late uh, uh, philosophical founder, Larry, who really was a lovely man, uh, many of us miss, miss him, um, he used to say that we just make the hive and the community brings the honey, which is what they really love and what they want to share. 
So I know that there have been lots of experiments and we all would love our cities to operate 24 hours and to offer a choice of lifestyle. And I can just, I, I gave some thought, like why does Black Rock City function well as a 24 hour city? And in our case, it's because we definitely have a balance of day and night experiences and they are placed throughout the city. We do population balancing. We know in some sense what's gonna be a little bit more popular, what's gonna be less. We scatter bars and, and clubs here and there. Uh, we tried to, to put the strongest uh, uh, members of our community or things we know are going to be really successful uh, and spread those things around. So there is a bit of urban planning uh, that goes into this. And people can have a choice. Are they, do they, there are some people that want to only experience the daytime part of, of Burning Man and it's very playful and lighthearted. And others want, are nighttime people and they want to go out at night and experience night culture or they want to go into the desert at night and look at the stars. They have those options. We have the 10 principles as a form of social agreement, or as I uh, said earlier, I think of it as a kind of social, uh, soft architecture to our city. Uh, we have unregulated hours and rely on self-regulation, though we do zone for loud sound. And we take a highly decentralized approach. We obviously celebrate uh, imagination and experimentation, which means sometimes when things don't work, that is fine. In fact, we celebrate that and we learn from it. And we end up with a fully engaged community creating the city that they really want to live in. Uh, the mission of Burning Man Project is to facilitate and extend the culture that has issued forth from this experience or this event into the larger world. And I will add there, for public uh, and the benefit of society. Applications for neighborhoods and cities have ranged from policies for public art and conditions for innovation urban planning and prototyping, which I'm gonna share some examples specifically shortly. Uh, we're very closely linked with uh, maker spaces uh, as well as with nightlife. Um, in fact, we were associated under the Obama administration with uh, the maker movement and invited to the White House to be part of discussions there at one point. Um, free and inclusive spaces that are free from a need to buy something in order to occupy that space. And what Mathieu was mentioning earlier when I spoke uh, in Berlin, I was speaking for people that run art spaces or have existed in squats outside of the formal uh, economic system who are under threat. And what they say is most important is just for people to be themselves separate from economic value. Um, so the idea of having free and inclusive spaces is profound and deeply important in our cities. Community resilience, some of the same things, the sense of belonging, neighbors knowing one another, taking care of one another, definitely related to community resilience. We have done experiments in participatory governance and creating councils to solve problems. Um, this is one I love. We've been credited with uh, making neighborliness and public service cool again. Um, uh, author Douglas Farr, who's an architect and an urban planner out of Chicago, uh, included a number of um, inspiration from Black Rock City in his book, and this was a big part. He's, was, he's very concerned about neighborhoods losing their social cohesiveness and even what it, what it means to be a neighbor anymore. Um, we have done experiments with cities and leave no trace strategies. Uh, I have personally worked with the San Francisco Health Department on trying to encourage a culture of bring your own cup to things to reduce waste. Uh, and we were part of a, a group that really helped to say that plastic straws must be banned in nightlife. Um, culture friendly permits and policies. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think that it, there are people in uh, the, the Berlin Stadnach Acht uh, International Nightlife Conference that think I'm a, a nightmare of San Francisco. I uh, do not represent uh, all of nightlife, but I am an advocate for it. And I've worked closely with the Entertainment Commission in San Francisco, which is in a way our version of the nightmare and represents the interests of both nightlife uh, and uh, places of entertainment and neighborhoods. And, I, I, and also uh, help to clarify permitting which is something that I'm hearing that maybe um, Montreal could benefit from. Uh, applications for disaster response and refugee crisis. One thing that's really cool, all of the, 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 the 
the generators, the containers with, with kitchens in them, uh, the infrastructure that we use in the desert to create a community and a collective joy are also used by members of our community to respond to disaster relief in uh, needs in their cities. And they have shown up time and again with the infrastructure from our temporary city uh, back in permanent cities when they, they are needed. And we've even been studied uh, for the conditions that lead to peace and cultural synergy, working with the uh, Washington DC uh, uh, Institute for Peace, um, precisely because we have people from both ends of the political spectrum and all walks of life coming and seemingly peacefully coexisting. So these are some uh, of the applications. Uh, when we wanted to bring more of this culture back into San Francisco, um, one of the things that we did was uh, a street fair. Uh, we called it a decompression heat the street fair. It was a, a way of bringing uh, a, some of the culture into, back into San, San Francisco. But instead of having a street fair with vendors, we inverted that model and instead made it about expression and gifting and generosity. Uh, we also uh, always left uh, and leave no trace of our activity, leave the park and the streets and wherever we are cleaner than it was. And we work very closely with neighbors and we have become uh, a kind of a poster child, an example for uh, how to do a street fair responsibly in a way that respects neighbors and, and builds uh, community. And because of that, we've often gotten sound permits that go much later than other groups because we've earned some city trust to do that responsibly. And along the lines, what began as an experiment in temporary community uh, has become an experiment in year-round distributed global community. Um, this is, uh, again, where I came in in uh, really the mid to late 90s when people started coming to Burning Man and saying, this experience has meant so much. How can I take this home? What, you know, how does this all work? So we have about 250 volunteer regional contacts or representatives in 125 uh, cities and 34 countries. Uh, we recognize over 100 official regional events that we don't produce, our community produces them according to uh, uh, the same values. Uh, they don't have to pay Burning Man anything. Uh, I'd like to say that we made a really dumb business decision, <laughs> but the best decision to encourage a, a cultural movement and something I'm very proud of. We made that decision intentionally. Um, and um, at this point, I think that our culture is in dialogue with cultures around the world. A member of our community um, said, uh, what would happen if we took the 10 principles and this uh, operating structure into a uh, unrented commercial space? Uh, and he came up with the, the title, Free Space. And he persuaded uh, a, a landlord for an unrented commercial property to let them have it for a month for free. And in that month, there were over 119 uh, free community-generated events, ranging from uh, job skills and training for uh, homeless and at-risk youth to uh, sobriety meetings to uh, arts uh, and uh, uh, hands-on workshops, bling out your bicycle, um, uh, community gardens, murals were painted. It was so much fun, they did it another month, and then after that, the building was rented. I don't think that was a coincidence. Um, and I also don't think that this is a long-term solution. But right now, many of our cities are sitting on more and more commercial property. The, in term, we have a large supply of it. And this would be a, a, a very practical way to increase the social surface area an expressive surface area in our cities again by redirecting some of that commercial space, not just into housing, but into uh, creative and social uh, forms. And uh, by the way, the symbol for free space are these two open brackets because it's just about providing the space and the social context and letting the community bring all of the content. Uh, and it was uh, implemented in a number of cities around the world. I'd like to share a couple of examples of how you can increase expressive surface area and green space uh, uh, and even social space uh, in cities. And this is an example of a temporary art pad. I'll tell you the story of it. We wanted to bring some of the art that was made for Burning Man for one week a year back into San Francisco. We had so much amazing art sitting in warehouses. So we talked to the Arts Commission, we said, look, we have all this art, can we put some of the art up in the city? They said, this is not so simple. You can't just go put up art. 
uh, we have a process, they can apply to the process, and it's difficult to get people to agree on permanent art. So we said, well, we don't need it to go up permanently. We just wanted to go up for a little while. So we came up with uh, the concept of a temporary art pad, which is actually a permanent location for art that changes every month or so, uh, every uh, year or so. And we worked with the Port of San Francisco that wanted to drive uh, more traffic uh, down along this waterfront near a new pier that they had installed. Uh, there are now about three of these. Uh, there's also an arts uh, plaza in San Francisco. We really should have more. There was one I heard that uh, Aarhus, Denmark, uh, uh, implemented. It's not rocket science, but the net result is more art, uh, pun intended. Um, uh, the net result is more art by living artists in dialogue with the city uh, that they're living in. It's, this is very different from monumental art that goes up often to commemorate a moment in time or something important, and there's a place for that. But right now, we also have an opportunity because all that monumental art that we thought would never age, we're finding maybe stands for things we didn't intend or that we no longer believe in. So my hope is that some of the, those monumental platforms can be repurposed for art that, that changes to be in living dialogue with the city. Um, I recently actually got into a little bit of an argument with somebody that is handling all of the art for the, the, the um, uh, Paris Metro. Uh, and they have a vast collection of permanent art. And I said, look, could you save some of the space just to, to put up art by people that live in that neighborhood so when they come to their train station and they see their artwork, it means something. This is another uh, example of how to uh, increase expressive surface area in cities, and I think this is very us. Uh, this idea, by the way, when it first appeared in 2013, was, I think, a little bit more revolutionary than it is now. In 2013, an artist in our community, Leo Villarreal, and members of our community raised about $6 million in private funding to put 25,000 LEDs uh, on the Bay Bridge, which was uh, just a regular bridge. Um, and really uh, went largely unnoticed compared to the Golden Gate Bridge, which everybody knows. Um, and they turned the bridge itself into a, a canvas for expression. The um, uh, light pattern changes and is never the same twice. Uh, and it's very lovely. And the net impact was that this side of the city, uh, which didn't have a lot of activity at the time, was kind of dark. The restaurants and hotels had increased business. It brought probably at least 50 million uh, more people in just to see openings and ceremonies and all this stuff. Uh, I live about uh, seven blocks away from here, and I can tell you that it reactivated the entire waterfront where people are happy to go walking along the waterfront at night again. It's, uh, it's safer. It's lovely. The artist th uh, th thinks of this project as a kind of digital campfire, and he just wanted people to be able to gather around it and to reflect and have a shared experience around art. Uh, this, uh, that piece, by the way, we are now uh, raising funds for to put up permanently. And, the, and the, the Bay Bridge has become the uh, kind of the night bridge of San Francisco and the bookend to the fabulous Golden Gate Bridge. And Leo was then commissioned uh, in London. He won the commission to do many bridges along the, the River uh, Thames. And there's, there's another um, artist in our community, Mads Vegas, in Copenhagen that has done the same thing with bridges in Copenhagen. Okay, so I'm sure, who's familiar with parklets? Raise your hand. I'm sure a lot of people are. This is not a new idea, but maybe people don't know this part of the story. Uh, parklets uh, in San Francisco began as a renegade design act by a group called Rebar. And Rebar were some members of our community that had sort of an architectural and design group. And what they did is they went to a parking spot and they put coins in the parking meter, but instead of parking a car there, they rolled out sod, put two trees, and created a bench. And it was a renegade, uh, you know, uh, design statement. Well, when we saw this, we said, you guys are amazing. What do you want to do next? Why don't you apply for a grant? And in 2007, they created this bicycle-powered park that they called a Parksicle. <laughs> um, and we encouraged them to create a template for International Parking Day because we learned that through our network, if we uh, shared templates, there would be more of that stuff that would happen. We learned that through free space. We learned that through our templates for how to do our style of events. Um, and two things happened in San Francisco. Um, residents said, I love this. I have a motorcycle. I don't really need my driveway. Can I turn my driveway into a, into a, a, a green space in a park? 
uh, commercial uh, places, restaurants, cafes, bars said, you know, San Francisco has very narrow, narrow sidewalks in many places. They said, we'd love to have El Fresco dining. So uh, there were two permits created in San Francisco, one for residential, one for commercial. But a rule was set, and I can tell you this comes from our community's values, that you did not need to purchase anything to use that space. And so in a sense, it was gifted um, public and social and green space. Some other examples, it was propagated uh, around the world. Uh, it is largely used uh, you know, as a form of tactical urbanism by many cities, uh, often as a temporary thing that maybe leads to you know, some permanent change. Uh, not surprisingly, during COVID, uh, many of these parklets became important to, uh, for the survival of these cafes and, and bars and nightclubs, and, and parklets became a model to be quickly replicated throughout the city to have outdoor dining uh, during COVID safely and to save those businesses. Um, and I'm in, uh, in full favor of them, but I also hope that we will get back to having uh, a nicer mix of free spaces as well as spaces that support sidewalk culture. And I'll say an interesting thing also, uh, during COVID, the San Francisco Entertainment Commission created an easier way to get a permit for live ent entertainment in these parklets called uh, a jam permit, just to add music. And it was very easy to get, which then helped support uh, bands and, uh, and DJs that could uh, enliven uh, the public sidewalk and streets. A more recent example uh, is this. Um, it, we had about a mile and a half stretch of road through Golden Gate Park in uh, San Francisco uh, that was open to traffic. Uh, it was close to traffic and uh, it turned into a bicycle um, uh, throughway. It was supposed to be temporary, but then people said, actually, we really like this and we'd like to reclaim this space. So we, uh, members of our community, um, worked with this, the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, a group called SF Walk that was encouraging walking, the SF Bike Coalition, and uh, a group that is dedicated to safe place for kids to play. And uh, the blocks up in the left-hand corner that came from Burning Man, it was a funded uh, piece in, uh, I don't, gosh, what year was that? Uh, was it, I don't know when, if it was 2020, if it appeared in 2022? Yeah, I guess it did, it was just there last year. Um, uh, became the first piece of art that was allowed to be climbed in Golden Gate Park. At first the security were like, is this okay? And the artists were like, yes, yes, it's fine. Um, and so this, I think, is a natural extension of a mashup uh, between parklets and art pads. And it's my hope that actually art from Burning Man every year will make an appearance here in, in the, uh, along JFK Promenade to enliven the space, but it will also continue to feature art by living artists. And I've had conversations with Phil uh, Ginsburg, who's the head of Reckon Park, about what to do with the monumental platforms that uh, statues have been removed from. And uh, I've been encouraging them to keep those and hold that, that space for art that's, uh, that can be in living dialogue with the city. What else? Oh, I keep pressing the other thing. So along the, the way, I began to really think about the importance of cities remaining flexible for the future uses um, of citizens. And I think that uh, art pads and parklets are a flexible uh, space or surface area we can add back to cities. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a group that is, is, was at the time working on the 100 uh, year plan for greater metropolitan Paris. Uh, we talked a lot about the 10 principles, we talked about other things, and I was made aware of this wonderful uh, group of architects that presented in 2018 at the French uh, pavilion at the Venice Architectural Biennale, the concept of infinite places. And there are a number of these. I think there's at least eight locations in Paris, if not 10, I'm forgetting the number. Uh, the idea being that uh, if there's a building that is uh, owned by the Ville, the, that it, um, and it's being decommissioned in some way, instead of having, turning it over to artists or the community for three to five years, hold it permanently and let the community and people that use that space help define what it should uh, look like and what features it should have. We don't know if in the future people are gonna be riding, wanting to ride around on, uh, on 
flying skateboards. Uh, we don't know, you know what citizens of the future will want to do with this space. But if we build upon every available square foot, and uh, particularly if we put the housing everywhere, which by the way, I, I'm in complete favor of housing density, but I think we have to be smart about both embedding culture permanently throughout cities, I'll probably repeat myself later about that, uh, and also holding space for the ephemeral and the unexpected in our cities so that cities can remain flexible and evolutionary. So to try to sum up some things, what are some lessons from Black Rock City and from our work? One is clearly to try to encourage bottom-up and community-driven solutions because they actually lead to more invested citizens and more social cohesion. Um, and in, in many cases, it can be done more effectively than a top-down approach, though I think there's a place for both. Uh, prioritize community and social space and expressive space and green space and prototype like crazy. Some of those things might become so beloved that they become a part of the permanent identity of your city. And if they don't, you just have more space to keep playing with that can be in a living relationship with the people and the place. And I want to say there's always a lot of talk about placemaking. Um, I struggle with the emphasis on place instead of people and relationships. I know that that's how it was originally intended, but every time I say placemaking, I really think of how do we bring people back into relationship with one another to create the conditions and the neighborhoods and the city that they want to live in. Um, place art in a civic role that builds relationships. Don't just treat it as an object or an aesthetic solution or a budgetary requirement. And please, for all that is kind and good in the world, don't instrumentalize artists as part of a real estate development scheme. Um, make art spaces, maker spaces, hacker spaces. You know, there's a wonderful 24-hour hacker space in, uh, in San Francisco that has its own community around it, uh, which is another kind of free space. Um, and definitely nightlife, top priorities, and seek to embed culture throughout a city rather than displace it in concentric rings. And I think one of the findings of the study which was presented this morning is that here in Montreal, you have almost all of your nightlife in um, how many? Was it three or four? Four, four uh, districts. I would urge you to take a holistic plan, look at the entire city layout, and look at empty buildings and spaces and figure out how they can be turned back into living, social uh, functioning spaces. Creative spaces, and particularly the ones that you don't even know how to zone because it's got light industrial going on, it's got public assembly, it's got you know people taking dance lessons, it's got kids after school programming. It has an open door that anybody can walk through. Those are the ones that are probably most worth um, building and protecting. Um, and I made this point already, create flexible space for the ephemeral and uh, experimental. This is part of cities remaining innovative and serving the need of future citizens. Um, yes, we do have banana parades and protests at, at, at Burning Man, it's a thing. Uh, zone to preserve and encourage culture, nightlife, and amplified sound areas. Um, and I think you, we really do. We heard this again and again uh, throughout the program today in everybody's talks that place is something to plan, uh, I'm sorry, sound is something to plan for. And there needs to be place keeping as well to keep what is authentic, the Montreal sound and music, the nightlife, the, the institutions that uh, for decades have been pre bringing people together. Um, and along with that, I think there needs to be financial and ownership tools accessible to culture generators. In San Francisco, one example is the uh, Community Arts Stabilization Trust, or CAST, uh, which my dear colleague Moi, Moi Eng currently leads. What they do is they will, when a cultural uh, space is in danger of being displaced or their property comes up for sale, uh, or they lose their space, they will, uh, uh, purchase the building, lease it back to them with an option to buy, help them work on their management, and they almost always buy it back within five years. Uh, this has saved a, a very important uh, uh, anchor uh, arts uh, tenant on Market Street. Um, 
that had done so much throughout the, the Tenderloin neighborhood. This has helped save a dance company that uh, lost their space, and now they own uh, an old, old theater. And I'll tell you that when you give ownership to creatives, they rent to other creatives. There's a wonderful model in San Francisco, Project Arto, which was a, uh, an entire old cannery building that was bought by artists in the 70s. It had a lot of upgrades that needed to be done. There are still hundreds of artists living there, and they have three theaters and a, uh, a dance uh, company as their tenants. So when you give ownership to arts uh, and creative culture people, uh, they're going to uh, continue to propagate that. Um, what else? Uh, you know, I think that we need agreed upon criteria and new models of trust and uh, risk management uh, between creative uh, spaces and our cities. Uh, in I've, I've spoken with so many people that work for cities and I've grown to be very compassionate to the role that they have, which is to try to um, have very fair processes for everybody and also to minimize uh, risk and maximize public safety. But art and culture is messy and inherently risky and so is innovation. Uh, so there has to be a balance of personal choice uh, and also responsibility on the behalf of uh, cultural incubators and creative spaces and nightlife to create spaces that, that are safe and sustainable. But time and again, it's, it comes down to, yeah, but Stephen, we're not sure exactly how to break the cycle of, of gentrification and which ones to help. I'm part of a learning expedition right now between the city of Oakland and Saint-Denis, a, a suburb of Paris that have faced very similar conditions. and. One thing I can share with you is that part of it is having first an initial uh, uh, amount of financial support uh, and knowledge and expertise to be able to purchase the property and then shortly thereafter a second infusion of cash because as soon as the ownership kicks into gear uh, and I think that Holtzmark had this experience in Berlin as well. We had a case uh, earlier that uh, about Holtzmark. You need more money to bring the place either up to code or to do all of these things to it. So it needs to be a two-phase financial support model. Um, and I really uh, am an advocate for having new measures of value and success of what it means to be a city and a more principled approach that goes beyond economics. And I know that this is common sense, but we have to remember that the social function of our cities, are they joyful? Are they, do they create a sense of wonder? You know, Society, uh, cities should be a place where civilization shines. Are they doing that? Or are we defaulting to tax base revenues and real estate prices? I want to also encourage more uh, of a sharing and decommodified approach to urban planning. Uh, and, and I'm a big fan of uh, the sharing economy. There have been many uh, members of our community that have create, created sharing platforms and applications. Uh, I think of uh, Couchsurfer here when it was at its height. Um, and, you know, I, I really sort of support the, uh, the sharing idea of Airbnb, but that needs to be regulated. I have seen a Airbnb, when it gets beyond renting a room in your house that you live in, decimate entire neighborhoods. I was just in uh, Lisbon in Portugal in the Alfama district. Uh, the families that used to live there and sing those songs and go to the marketplaces have all been dis displaced. And there's tons of, of empty Airbnb places. So, the, uh, and Portugal, I think, is a good example of going too far to attract new residents. They, uh, they sold their, their, their city without realizing it. Um, so those are some things, and I know it's a lot, um, but it's also common sense. And I really want to urge all of us, you know, to hold space for the fun, the strange, the joyful, and unexpected, the weird, and delightful. And this talk really is not just about urban planning at all. It's about holding uh, a, a place as caretakers for the human imagination and for what it, what it means to be in relationship with one another. And I want to really acknowledge and thank everybody's work in this room. All of the sessions today have been fantastic. I want to be here all tomorrow to learn from all of you. And uh, I think the, the, the collective knowledge and heart in this room is enough. It's more than enough to make a huge difference. 
and I would be delighted to take any questions or clarifications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steven. Such an enlightening uh, talk. It's a strange thing, isn't it? We just went out to the desert to get away from, you know, to have some freedom, and then all of this crazy shit happened. Yeah, but also, you just start talking, and then all this crazy shit happens in your head, and we're like, and, and, and we, we keep going with you because your narrative is just so, is so, so incredible. So, we kind of ran out of, ran I out ran of out time. time. You know, I've done uh, a few Zooms with you already. Too much to say. But we have like maybe 10 minutes for uh, some questions, and um, I hope you have some, or maybe, ah, uh, yeah, there, there we go. All right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wonder if you would speak to the tension between um, freedom and living in cities. So you talked, you just now talked yeah. about uh, wanting to run away to, from yeah. the city to find freedom. But then as we yeah. build cities, we accrue sets of rules in order to promote harmony and avoid harm. So um, I just, and I, yeah. so I find that tension to be very interesting. It is very interesting, and it, it shows up profoundly, I think, in our culture, and it, it, it uh, is even reflected in the Ten Principles. You know, what, uh, the, there is a relationship between uh, radical self-expression and being in relationship to other people and uh, civic responsibility. So some of the irony of having complete freedom to be whoever you really want to be is suddenly finding out that you are powerful and that you can hold space for other people and it, uh, I will tell you uh, very personally that I have gone through a journey of uh, deep inward reflection. My connection to society is through the indoor of the self. And I came out the other side feeling uh, uh, so profoundly like comfortable in my skin, though not all the time. <laughs> we all have our moments uh, that uh, I'm able to show up for other people and I want to. And I, as an artist, uh, my idea of a medium was personal reality at one point, and now I think my medium is social reality. And I think that comes from what is an evolution from having complete freedom and also power uh, to influence things and to show up in society. We have another question here. Hi, Stephen. Um, thank you so much for everything that you do for Burning Man Project. Nine time burner here. Yay. Um, Spock Mountain Research Labs, BMR, uh, BMIR radio all the time. Uh, and I also started the first uh, regional burn here in Montreal, Ignition, back in like 2003. Yay! So profoundly changed my life, most difficult physical and psychological experience, but also never laughed so hard ever in my whole life. So I'm also on the board of 2424, and so there's been a convergence. It's, you know, I bring all these things back to the way yes. that I live my own life. And I've actually, a couple of years ago, did a research project on sort of responsibilizing of communities, sort of self-policing ideas. I think of the Rangers. I have many friends who've been Black Rock Rangers. And this is a Canadian perspective, but the first time I went there, I was shocked at how much law enforcement, federal, state, yeah. community law enforcement. And then there's the Rangers as somewhat of a buffer between law enforcement and the community. And you it sort of is a little follow-up about permissiveness uh, or sort of freedom and the balance and the tension. So permissiveness in culture or expression, then you have safety and harm, then you have the American sort of policing mm -hmm. situation. I'm wondering if you could like talk a little bit more about sort of the birth of the Rangers, this idea of the community police. You touched on it a little bit, but I'm kind of yep. more interested in the relationship between the Rangers and all of these levels of American police, that, that the fest that Festival. That is a the point. Project that is a point of tension for uh, for sure in uh, our city. Uh, we seek to have positive relationships with the police, but we are assigned to those police officers as part of our uh, uh, federal permit to use the land. We're on federal land, and Burning Man is actually the largest single payer for the use of public land. Uh, something that's quite tragic is that we are give 1.2 million dollars in art grants to artists. We give nearly $3 million to the U.S. government and, uh, and uh, governmental agencies and, and the law enforcement that they assign us. Um, I would much rather be giving $3 million to the artists and $1 million to the government. Um, we uh, really don't 
need all of the law enforcement that are assigned to us. We work with, uh, I think, at least three different, uh, three or four different agencies. Uh, and it, we got to a conciliatory place. Um, and the growth of the Rangers really came from when we were uh, more of an autonomous zone, but we wanted to take care of people, but we to take, take care of them in a minimal way. Uh, they were a helpful presence. They looked out uh, so that if people didn't get lost or might steer people in the right direction, but very hands-off. Um, and uh, again, the Rangers are really our community's first uh, line of contact when there is an issue. That's who they trust going to. Yeah, uh, I think so. If and actually, uh, is Merrick still here? Um, Amsterdam tried the experiment of, of having um, a civilian uh, presence in uh, squares in Amsterdam, and that did work quite well. Um, you will, you know, if neighbors are watching out for each other, that does work. But there are times when you need law enforcement, so we work in partnership with them. Um, we're not the autonomous zone that we were in the early 90s. And uh, I think that's okay and part of this, the evolution of this social experiment. But, uh, you know, between you and me, I w uh, we would all, I think, like to have fewer law enforcement at the event. We do believe and know that we could take care of more of it ourselves, though there are times when we need to work with law enforcement. And we work with all the, like, the transportation and uh, the transit people and everything because, you know, we have a lot of people coming in uh, a, a single road that goes two ways, and we have to interface with all of the city and governmental agencies. And it is crazy. We have a you know full-time legal team and full-time government uh, relations team, um, and none of us plan to get into that. <laughs> but we needed to to uh, honestly defend our rights and to, allow freedom. and to allow for freedom and permissiveness, and for people in some uh, cases to find that look, no, you have an agreement with your neighbor. Go talk to them, and that's often what rangers do. They they're very calming presence. They're skilled in de-escalation training. They take how many hours of training is it? Is it do you remember? Is it six? Is it nine? I wasn't a ranger. Oh, you weren't a ranger. Yeah, it's um, eight hours. And then you have to, you can't be a ranger the first year you go. You have to you understand the culture. You, and then you shadow a ranger. It's really a position of responsibility and great respect. And again, all the social capital comes because they come from the community. And I, I think that there could be more of that done in, in cities as well. Be, it's also linked to creating welcoming spaces for people. You know. Um, if you have been a person who has been margin marginalized and had terrible experiences with every police officer or are deeply frightened of police and that you will be treated in a different way than someone that looks different from you, then uh, you don't want to go to the police even when you need to. So it, it is very helpful, uh, and I think this is, will be the next wave of how do we create welcoming spaces? How do we create, like, what, what do those people look like and how do they show up? Are they wearing uniforms? Are they wearing things with happy faces on them? All right, we might have like three minutes left. I'm gonna keep the last question for myself, Stephen. <laughs> Get it. Sorry, guys. Get it. I organized all of this, so. Um, you, you mentioned at the begin. you mentioned that, you know, the original idea of Burning Man was to have this temporary, uh, this autonomous zone or temporary autonomous zone to reuse the words of Akim Bey. Um, but with success often comes like this recuperation through capitalism that kind of recuperates mm -hmm. everything. And of course, I'm a zero time burner. Um, the, the vision we, uh, we hear now, what, burner has become, what Burning Man has become is this tech bro playground of billionaires. And so my question is, what can we do to keep the values, the sustainable values we have that are driving our communities when we start to have successes and then this other mainstream crowd invades yes. and sometimes puts a je jeopardy the, the core values of our community? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Uh, you know, it, we actually asked our community what we should do about uh, uh, cultural uh, dissolution uh, of values that was happening from people that would come with um, large plug and play camps and then charge camp dues that, uh, that we were clear they were profiting on the community in some way, or in some cases just coming uh, to have a vacation instead of to co-create a, a city of art and expression. 
Look, uh, I have to tell you that we, as a strategy, in some ways welcomed um, people of influence and means to join our social experiment. If we're going to have social change in the world, we need to uh, lay out a broad welcome mat and even invite some of the problem. <laughs> it was part of a social change strategy. It threw things out of whack a little too much. We had to do a cultural uh, adjustment that actually made it much harder for people to just have things arranged for them. Uh, such as making a rule that now they have to drive in. If they're going to come in with, uh, with a uh, RV, they have to drive it in. We're, they're not, they can't just hire their minions to go and drop it off. There's still people trying to work around that, but we've been trying to cl clamp down on it. Um, and I think that the answer to your question is really, uh, the challenge is how quickly and how many, how fast. Uh, we had earlier a presentation by people that are involved in the tourist board. I had a long conversation with a group also that was involved with the I Am Amsterdam tourist campaign that was too successful and brought too many tourists into Amsterdam, consuming the culture too quickly, and it started to displace the local bakeries and uh, the uh, butchers with uh, souvenir stores selling small replicas of Dutch buildings made in China. True story. And they started having fights because too many people from outside of the culture were coming to get drunk and party. So they ceased their entire uh, advertising campaign. So some of the things that we do, and in my role advising regional events when they say that they're experiencing cultural uh, erosion, I go look at their website as an example and I say, see all these pictures of young and attractive people having cocktails and partying and dancing? Take them all down now. <laughs> and replace them with people working really hard and falling down in the dirt laughing or volunteering, or picking up trash. Change your signal, and reinforce your values. And talk about what you stand for, and be patient and educate people, and strike that balance between what being welcoming and holding a ground culturally. And I can tell you for everybody that thinks, oh, Burning Man is definitely past its, uh, its prime, the damn thing is still working. It is still working, and within that city is every form of expression, and there are extremely poor artists, and yes, there are billionaires, uh, and we try to convert the billionaires to patrons of the arts and to people that invest their money in um, positive things and not just for self-enjoyment, uh, and sometimes it actually works. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Please, a good round of applause for Stephen Raspa. Thank you. Such an honor to have you here. Um, for those of you who still have a little bit of energy, uh, we have a great, great, great documentary showing in about 10 or 15 minutes downstairs. God said, give him drum machines on the history of Detroit techno. Everyone you can think about, they're all in this film. You should go watch it. We have a lot of tickets that were sold for free, but you know, people don't show up when it's free sometimes. So we're probably gonna have room for everybody who wants to, to check it. So uh, je vous invite à descendre en bas voir le, le film uh, pour 20 heures. God said, give him drum machines. It's on the story of Techno Detroit. Merci beaucoup d'avoir été là et on se voit demain matin. See you tomorrow morning at 10. Hi. I'm Steven. Hello, Steven. Really ah, you and you're with, you're with Mutech. I'm with Mutech. How are you involved with Mutech, by the way? Have we met before? I've met some of the people with Mutech, but I don't know if I met you.